I, I'm curious, um, since there's a variation in rainfall within the city of Seattle, I'm wondering if there's that same variation in wind pattern. I live in a particular neighborhood of Beacon Hill and it doesn't seem to get quite the winds and knock on wood, we s rarely lose power uh, when other neighborhoods do because of the winds. So I'm wondering, within the city of Seattle, is there that much variation? There is, and the key thing is your proximity to water. The winds blow much more rapidly over water. They can, it, can, it can be twice as fast over Lake Washington or over Puget Sound than it is over land. It could be three times as, gr as great. And you all realize this if you ever drive across the Evergreen Point Bridge, right? I mean, it can be blowing like mad out there. Uh, another way you can see it is we have a wonderful website that, that we developed with the Washington State Department of Transportation. It's called Ferry Weather. And we, there's, there are weather sensors on Washington State ferries as they cross back and forth across the sound. And you can, and it's just amazing. It could be eight knots in Elliott Bay, and it could be 30 knots in the middle of the sound. So proximity to water is the, is the most important thing. And then there's other issues. If you're down in a valley, a lot of times you're protected. If you're on the top of a crest, it's, the winds are stronger. So that's happening too. Note card question. Why don't we get more thunder and lightning? Well, I think I answered that, but we don't get more thunder and lightning because of the Pacific Ocean and because of the cold water. Okay, we have a question back there. This is regards to uh, volcanoes. I've seen some pictures lately of some great um, lightning on the volcano up in Iceland. Could you comment on how that could have formed? Since you said that it didn't affect us with the Mount St. Helens, that's right. You can get you know vivid lightning, you know really active lightning in volcanic eruptions as the ash particles rub each other, and you could you could develop these charges, and you get this vi very very strong lightning uh, results. So I mean th that that's true. It's not a really a weather effect. It's really a matter of the the static charges created by the lightning. Note card question. What's the status of the radar station on the coast? Okay, that's one of my favorite topics. Um, <laughs> well, uh, we're gonna get one. Uh, Senator Cantwell got the money. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, it's really amazing. I mean, I mean she, she's just tremendous. And she, she, she got it very quickly why we needed this radar. And she, she happens to be in a very powerful position. She's the chair of, of the Senate committee that oversees NOAA. So <laughs> then Gary Locke is, is head of commerce <laughs> and the head of and the head of NOAA is from Oregon. So that, that probably didn't hurt. So anyway, the ra the radar is funded and uh, during the next the it there's a chance it may get in as, as early as September of next year. So so anyway, we're definitely gonna get the radar. Well, it's going to be very much like the Weather Service radars that are out there right now. Um, very powerful, 10, ce 10 centimeter wavelength radar. They'll be able to see two, 300 kilometers off the coast. So we'll be able to see the storms coming in. It'll be a Doppler radar. It'll not only, only be able to see where it's precipitating, but it'll get the winds as well. It will be one of the first radars that have a new technology that will be on all the radars in the country soon. It's called dual polarization. It's able, so the, the current radars send out electromagnetic waves, microwaves, with, with one polarization, where the waves are horizontally polarized. This one will also send out vertical polarized, too. If you have both of them, you can do all kinds of interesting things. You can tell the type of precipitation. You can get a much better idea of the intensity of the precipitation. So it's going to be tremendous, and, and our radar will have it from the first day. mentioned that the uh, weather models had gotten a lot better. Could you discuss, I've heard there's something like 20 different competing weather models out there? Right. Well, the, t the main tool the weather forecasters use are something called weather models. You may hear, sometimes they mention these on TV, right? You, see, you hear Jeff Renner saying the weather model says this, right? Uh, anyway, th what these are basically are com computer simulation models. The equations that describe the atmosphere are coded generally in Fortran. And you know we run these on the most powerful computers that available, and they are able to forecast, simulate the future. That's how we forecast the weather. That's the main tool. Um, th we have a whole collection of these models. We have, at the Weather Service office here, they probably have 
10 different models available to them, from all, from some from the United States and some from overseas. Um, one way they differ is they have, some of them have better resolution than others. In other words, how fine a feature can you, s can you forecast? Uh, at the University of Washington, we're, you know, we're cutting edge. We're, right now, I'm running a computer model in which the spacing of the grid points in which we solve these equations are about one kilometer apart. That's very good. The National Weather Service top model now is about 12 kilometers. So the more, the more computer power you have, the more points you can have, the better the resolution, and the more you can get local weather features. And this week is a perfect example how far we've come. Um, for instance, on Sunday, it was dry here in Seattle. Why? Because we were rain shadowed. We were in the, we were rain in the rain shadow of the Olympics. The computer model had it. Uh, we had a surge to the Strait of Juan de Fuca with winds of 50 to 60 miles per hour. The models had it. Ten years ago, we, would, we couldn't have done that because the computer models didn't have enough resolution to do it. So we're making very rapid advances. The other thing that's really coming along is satellite. The ability to look from space and get weather information. I mean, what we're, we're capable of doing now is it's like Star Trek. You know, when, when they got around the planet, you know, Spock or Data, you know, they would, they would scan the planet and they'd have all this information. Well, we can do that now. And it's just getting better and better and better. So we're getting all this information over the oceans. So we know what's coming in to a great degree. We can't be surprised anymore. We have a note card question that's kind of a follow-up to that. Um, we're asking if you could comment on the likely future development of weather prediction models on the micro and macro scale. Well, they're, they're going to get better and better. I mean, the resolution, eventually all the models will be one kilometer spacing. Um, but there's a new technology that is also coming in with forecasting, uh, and that's called ensemble or probabilistic prediction. Now, in some ways, my profession has been lying to you and deceiving you for the last <laughs> 30 years. Oh. You knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, you're deceived every single night that you watch uh, Steve Poole or Jeff Brenner or Rebecca Stevenson, right? Or there's somebody from Channel 13 here, so I better watch out. <laughs> and there's certainly somebody from Channel 9. But <laughs> <laughs> when you watch one of these TV guys, okay, they will say, they'll give you the 10 day forecast, right? And they'll say that the forecast five days from now, the high will be 73 and the low will be 58. What is the chance it'll be that number? Not much, right? The way we've been forecasting the past is to, we'd run our best computer model, we'd get our best shot of reality, and we'd say, that's the forecast. But that's all wrong, because there's all this uncertainty, right? We have to start our computer models with a description of the atmosphere. That description's imperfect. Our computer models are imperfect. There is uncertainty there, right? A lot of times, people in my profession, we know that the forecast is uncertain. This is information we don't communicate very well. Sometimes we know where you got it, and sometimes we know we're unsure. But you never hear that, right? Well, there's a technology of forecasting that's going to change all of this, that's going to dominate in this, this coming century, and that's called probabilistic forecasting. We have enough computer power now to run not one forecast, but 100 forecasts, each one starting slightly differently but reasonably, okay? So imagine if you have 100 forecasts, okay? No, no, pe some people are laughing, but it's, this is serious. If, if they all are forca forecasting the same thing, then you can have some confidence, right? That this forecast looks pretty good, right? If you're changing all kinds of stuff and you keep on getting the same answer, then you have confidence in your forecast. On the other hand, if they're all over the place, you know, that's, not, that's just the opposite. If half of them say rain, 50% chance of showers, right? Right now, the only thing that we give you probabilities on is precipitation. But with this technology, we can do this with everything. And if you want to see an example of this, you know, we're doing this at the University of Washington. We have an ensemble system right now. And if you ever want to see some probability forecasting, probabilistic forecasting, we have a website called Probcast. You go to www.probcast.com, P-R-O-B-C-A-S-T, and you can see a sample of this kind of stuff. So that's the future of forecasting. So 20 years from now, if the TV guys say, this is the temperature, rather than saying, this is the, ra this is the, this is the range of temperatures we expect, and this is the probability of that, then we're doing a bad job. The only problem for TV is they don't, ha the, they don't have enough time to do this, right? They gen generally have like two and a half minutes. So that's not enough. 
So ultimately, we're going to have to deliver the forecast either over the web or through, you know, your, your, your iPhone there or something or, or something like that. We have to, we're going to have to deliver it directly to you for your location. Okay. Okay, I had a question regarding uh, low pressures. One of the features of uh, severe low pressure storms is uh, coastal flooding. That is, increase in tides of uh, feet o over normal tidal levels. And I've always been curious uh, how this can occur in simple terms, how the low pressure creates a rise in an ocean, an open system, with a high density fluid water uh, compared with air, which we know is accelerated by low pressure. Right. Well, there's a few ways that low pressure sensors can increase the, f the uh, height of the water. Near a shore, you can basically push water up. That's how hurricanes work. You, you, get, you can get a, you, you, the winds push on the water, and you can push water up into coastal areas and cause a, uh, a heightening of, of the water surface. That's, that's one way. Um, another way is just the pressure itself. Um, if you low pressure can act, if the low pressure in the atmosphere actually causes the water level to rise. Because if there's low pressure here, there's higher pressure someplace else. It all has to balance out. And so that's another effect. So if you have really, really low pressure, that will cause the, the water level to rise. And in fact, we saw that this winter. This winter we had a period, and you may remember that, we had uh, extraordinarily low pressure. Remember there were record-breaking low pressures in Los Angeles and Nevada and in Arizona? And we actually had a very low pressure here for a while. During that period, the, uh, the tide tables weren't any good. <laughs> Because the, the, the water was actually much higher because the pressure was lower. So it's pushing water up and is, is one big way, and the other way is just is low pressure will cause the, pre the water level to rise. We have a note card question. Should I go to the spa tomorrow or Thursday? I don't want to miss any good weather. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what you mean by good weather. <laughs> For a meteorologist, good weather is bad weather. <laughs> But actually, it looks pretty blah for the remainder of this week. There's no major storm. So you can go to spa anytime. I enjoy going out on the, the water in our boat and fishing in October. And it might be clear, no fog going out there. And I'm not a large enough boat to have radar, but I get out off um, Kingston area and the, as thick as can be. And the area I want to go fishing in is heavily fogged in. Is there a way to determine that before I get out there? Uh, you know, waste an hour's worth of travel to get there? Well, how do you know it's foggy? Well, I think the, the best way would probably be to look at a satellite picture. The, uh, we, the high resolution satellite pictures, which are available on the web, um, that's the best way. The visible satellite picture would be what I'd look at uh, if, if, the, if the sun was up. And that you can get on our website, at the University of Washington, the Weather Service. It's the one kilometer imagery that's the highest resolution visible satellite pictures. At night, you can, even, you can see fog, too. Th the Weather Service, and it's on their, on their website, has something called the fog product, which uses several wavelengths from the satellites to actually paint out where the fog is during the nighttime. So that's how I would do it. I mean, you could look at fog reports at some, you, you could look at some of the observing stations, but I, I would definitely look at the satellite picture. Um, just go to, well, you just go Google, in the Google, just do National Weather Service uh, Seattle. And you and, and then click on satellite once you get there. That's that, that. That's what I would do for fog. We have a somewhat related note card question: What is the first chart or satellite picture or whatever to look at when we get up in the morning to get an overview of the weather? Well, if, if you're a meteorologist or for anybody. <laughs> I, I, I think this person specifically wants to know for him. Okay. Well, I guess if I was if I was a layman and I was going to look at one thing, it would probably be a satellite picture. It would probably be an infrared satellite picture, uh, because uh, you, you everybody know there's two different types of satellite pictures, right? There's you know, or there's several, but the ones in TV are visible and infrared. Uh, they often show the infrared. The visible is what you would see if I threw you into space. Infrared. Or if you were in space, <laughs> infrared is what they they often show on television, and that's showing you basically the temperature of the clouds. When it's white, that means it's cold, and that means it's high. And it's dark I or gray, it's a middle level cloud. So generally, you see the infrared pictures, and that's uh, that's the first thing I would look up, look at, look at, because that that would show you what's coming in.
I was wondering if you could comment on the current state of the uh, math education lawsuit and that whole. Ooh, good. <laughs> Questions about the math education lawsuit, the one for the city of Seattle? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I, I'm very active in a group called Where's the Math? Where's the math dot com, okay? C O M. Yeah. Don't go to org. This is some th that's the opposite side. Uh, <laughs> it, it turned out, you know, so, so it's a group of us, parents and educators who are trying to improve math education. It turns out one of the people who are on the opposite side from us, uh, who teach math education at the University of Washington, we forgot to get .org, and so they went and they grabbed .org, okay? <laughs> anyway, so we won the lawsuit, okay? We went to, you know, went to King County Superior Court, and basically they found that the city of Seattle, in selecting this horrible book, well, was, uh, was capricious and arbitrary, okay? It's amazing, okay? A book that was found, th th uh, this is a book that was found uns uh, unsound, by the, by the superintendent of public instructions, math experts. Anyway, we won, okay? And so they're supposed to review this, you know, review their selection. Uh, they decided to, to take it back to court. So they're going to appeal. So that's, that's where that is. Um, we won Bellevue. Bellevue is going to have very good math, which I'm good. But unfortunately, we just recently lost Issaquah, which is going to have terrible math throughout the whole, th the whole K to 12. So. Anyway, that, that's the la latest situation right now. S school district, yeah, I'm sorry, school district. Uh, this person from the back asks, can you talk about the current state of the snowpack and your snow predictions for the coming year? And adds, thanks, love your blog. Oh, thank you. Well, the snowpack has made an amazing recovery. <laughs> and <laughs> we, you know, we, it, it, you know, we are in an El Nino year. And generally, El Nino years, we have poor snowpack. And on April 1st, it was, it was, you know, it was down. It was down to, you know, the ca Central Cascades were down to 50%. Um, the Olympics were good um, even then. But we've had a very, very wet and very cool period, which, uh, which I'm embarrassed to say the Climate Prediction Center got it 180 degrees wrong. <laughs> they, they were going for a, you know, a dry, warm period the last few weeks. But anyway, so... So anyway, it, it's, it's amazing how much it's come up. Right now, the Cascades is generally around 80% of normal. Um, the Olympics are uh, 140. It's about 100% for the Okanagan, 106% for the Yakima drainage. So it's good enough now that I think there's going to be no issue. And in fact, a lot of the local districts, they're pretty savvy, and they've been holding more water than, than they normally would. So we're actually... In there's not going to be any, any serious water issues for, for us the, uh, this, this coming s summer. How do you read the, uh, Dr. Mass, how do you read the water vapor satellite pictures? I can't, I can't figure out how to read those, those, those uh, pictures. R right. There's, there's another satellite image that sometimes you see in TV, and these are called the water vapor imagers, imagery. And what it does, th this is with satellites look down at the planet, and it, l and it looks for the water vapor. And sometimes they show this on television. And where it's very white, that means there's a lot of water vapor in the upper atmosphere. And it's very dark, that means it's not. And so it's a way for us to s The nice thing about it, if there's no clouds, we can still see the swirls in the water vapor. And so it's very useful to see structures even when there's no clouds in the atmosphere. So that's how we use the water vapor imagery. Well, it's just to water vapor. No, this is just to water vapor. Uh, note card question, basic question, cyclone, typhoon, hurricane, windstorm, tornado, what's the difference? Tornado is small, and, it's, and, and that's associated with the thunderstorm. So these are very small funnels. These are associated with intense convective storms. Typhoons and hurricanes, you know, those are generally tropical, strong tropical storms. And cyclone, well that really any low center could be a cyclone. The kind of cyclones I was talking about was mid-latitude cyclones. I'm surprised no one's asking about global warming. That's really interesting. <laughs> it's the next note card okay. question, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but first, audience question. Maybe this means something. <laughs> uh, my question's around the uh, sustainability of um, the uh, large urban areas down in the southwest, like Las Vegas, uh, and the, uh, the water supply issues there. Can you talk about that related to uh, uh, climate and rainfall? 
Sure. Well, I mean, the trouble is we have all these people down there where they don't belong. <laughs> it, it's, the, it's the essential problem. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, we have a massive population in a, in a, in an arid, a completely arid area. And unfortunately, the, the predictions of the, glo uh, the, the climate model simulations are not very favorable. Basically, they're almost all unanimous in predicting that under, glo under global warming, that there will be a drying of the southwest United States. So, you know, you have a lot of population right now. It's growing, and there's going to be less water down there, and it's going to be hotter. I, I think I, we're pretty sh I mean, in terms of confidence, that one thing we're pretty confident about. Note card question. In an inconvenient truth, Al Gore asserts that due to human-caused climate change, the planet has seen and can expect to see more devastating, more dramatic weather events. Assuming this is true, how will we see the effects of climate change in Pacific Northwest windstorms? Right now, this is, the, this is an area that's more sensitive. And this is the area of, of hype. And there's been a tremendous amount of hype about intensity of storms of the global warming. And let's take around here. There really is no evidence there's, and there's no reason to expect that we're going to see more intense storms here under global warming. And in fact, it could, it could actually turn out to be just the opposite. And I'll tell you how, this w how that could work. Um, hurricanes are a whole, different ca a whole different thing. But for our kind of storms, our storms are driven by differences in temperature. Remember that? Well, most of the, glo most of the global uh, cl climate models predict that the change in temperatures will weaken at low levels as the Arctic areas warm up. And also it predicts this area of strong temperature gradient and the strong jet that's associated with it will move northward. Well, what now our storms are all dependent upon this. If this thing moves northward, we could end up with weaker storms. So it's really not, uh, at this point, it is not clear what we should expect at all. And anybody who tells you that we're going to get more intense windstorms, for instance, they're just not telling you the truth. And, and there'll be more, it'll be heavier rainfall here. Again, the moisture may go north of us. So it, we, most of the climate models predict that Alaska and, and into British Columbia will be wetter. But the question is, what about us? And it's not certain right now. I mean, that's the truth, I think. 